does what you will. You need to settle that in your heart once and for all. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he dealt with a sin issue, but he also dealt with a sickness issue. And the Bible makes it very clear that by your stripes, you are healed. And he's not talking about in the future, he's talking in his present tense that you are healed today. So we need to be people that uh, accept what Jesus Christ said. You are not a candidate for sickness or disease. We need to be people that live the life that God has, has called us to live. So let's read the word of God this morning and then we'll uh, share what God wants to say. We're going to read from 2 Kings chapter 5 and we'll read from verse 19 down. This is what the word of God says. After Naaman had travelled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said to him, My master was too easy on Naaman, the Arabian, by not accepting for him what he has brought, as surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, as I answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me for the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take the two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gezai to upset them and then tied up the talents of silver in two bags and two sets of clothing. He gave them to the two of his servants and they carried them out of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hills, he took the things from the servants and put them away in his house. He sent the men away and then left. Then he went and stood before his master, Elijah. Where have you been, Gehazi, Elijah asked. Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elijah said to him, was not my spirit with you when you went, that you met the man of God, when he got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money, or to accept clothes, olive clothes, vineyards, flocks, herds, men servants and maid servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elijah's presence, and he was leprous as white as snow. God will bless his word to us this morning. You know, folks, when God calls a person into ministry, when God calls a group of people like his church to move in the supernatural power of God, the purpose behind it is to show convincing proofs that the message that you are declaring is authentic. God always says in his word that he will confirm his word with power, with signs and wonders. And this in turn causes people to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, to put their faith in him. In fact, in John 2 and verse 23, it tells us that many people saw the miraculous signs Jesus was doing and believed in his name. I want you to notice it says the miraculous signs he was doing. So it was ongoing work of the miraculous that flowed through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus never just operated in the miraculous because he was the Son of God. You have to understand he operated in the miraculous because he was the Son of Man, anointed with the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who is available to you today. So he moved in this particular way. And Jesus wants you to move in that same way today. So all those powers, the signs, the wonders, drew people into relationship with Jesus Christ. Even the disciples, when they saw the water turned into wine, believed and put their trust in him. So the miraculous causes people to believe. And every believer today really is a candidate to work in the supernatural power of God. The early church moved in that power. Jesus demonstrated power. And the church wept and would do well today to demonstrate the same power when we move, or the same method when we move in evangelism. Now, not only does God want his people to evangelize, that part of our mandate, in other words, that we're actively to share our faith, to meet the needs of the people. When the early church was sent out, or the disciples even were sent out, the Bible tells us that he was to meet the needs of the people, to heal the sick, to cleanse the leper, to drive out the demon, to raise the dead. All those things were spoken in the same breath. In other words, the same power, the same faith that heals the sick will drive out the demon. It's as easy as that. God spoke those words to 
uh, his disciples and he speaks those words to us today but not only does God want us to evangelize I believe that God wants us to equip the next generation he wants us to equip the next generation so that they carry the works of Jesus forward really to a higher level really to a greater level so that they experience things that we have never experienced today and all the way through the Word of God there are examples of people that mentor other people and teach them the things of God so they can carry the things of God forward. For example, Moses, the Bible tells us, was a mighty man of God. He was the one that led the children of Israel out of Egypt and he led them out of that place of captivity through a demonstration of superior power because he belonged to a superior <coughs> kingdom. He demonstrated over all the gods of Egypt there was wonders, miracles that took place, the likes that we've never seen even to this day. So he's a mighty man of God. But it was Joshua, the one that Moses had mentored, the one that he had advised, the one that he had trained, who led them into a greater place in God. So what I'm saying, that as you mentor someone else, as you teach them, as you deposit what God has shown you into their life, they are greatly advantaged to take the word of God forward. It's no good everything that God has given you, dying with you, all the knowledge, all the experience, all that gifting, it has to be released into other people's lives. So Joshua was someone who clearly had a teachable spirit. He learned to stay in the presence of God. Even when Moses entered into the tabernacle of God and then came out, the Bible tells us that Joshua remained. So his desire and his passion was for the Lord. And God wants people to have that same passion today. He was teachable. He learned from those who were over him in the Lord. You know the word of God tells us in Psalm 145, verse 4 to 5, it says, One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of your glorious splendor, your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. So one generation is to commend his works to another. And that simply means that not only are you going to approve the works of God to other people, but you recommend the glorious life that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ to the next generation. You see, as believers today, we are not just responsible for this generation. We're responsible for the next generation. You have got to deposit truths within the lives of young people so that those young people can embrace it. And one of the greatest ways of depositing those truths is to be an example to them. How many examples is it today? You know, the world wants to give them examples. All these pop stars, all these celebrities that live low lifestyles. They may have high money, high salaries, but they live low lifestyles. They're examples to the children, and the children are embracing that lifestyle because they see no example within the body of Christ. They need to see those examples within your life. If you're always complaining in, in your home, if you're always doubting the word of God, then they adopt the same sort of attitude to God that you have. But if you're someone of faith, that someone stands on the promises of God, they will learn to stand upon the promises of God. And that was why someone like Moses mentored Joshua so we could carry the work of God forward, like a passing of the baton, so to speak. He was to carry the next life forward to greater heights, greater things. So God wants us to be people that would recognize that we've got to deposit in the next generation. And the Bible tells us to speak of his works, to speak of the works of Jesus, the happenings, the miraculous in your life, to testify. Doesn't the Bible tell us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy? When a prophecy is released to you, it's an offer from the Lord. It's God's intention that he wants to bring about in your life. So when you testify, you are speaking to a person like a prophetic word to say, this is what God wants to do for you. And you should be testifying on a regular basis to the amazing things, to the answered prayers, to the great things that God is doing within your life. So he's telling us really that we need to be people that testify about the miraculous happenings in our life. 
And that will encourage other people to reach higher and to trust into the Lord Jesus Christ. Because people will just simply think, if they've done it for you, they'll do it for me. We've got to believe the word of the living God. Listen, we sing songs, don't we, like Jaira today. That's about the provision of God. That means he can meet your every need. But he's more than just Jaira. He's Jehovah Rapha, isn't he? So he's the God that will heal you. He'll provide for you in every area of your life. He's a good, good father. And he wants you to know that. He wants you to believe his report, not just to believe the doctor's report. It's amazing how many believers today override the word of God to believe what the doctor says. And yet, if they would give the pastor the same time they gave the doctor, they would be healed. If they would believe the word like they believe the doctor, their lives would change dramatically change. We've got to get back to believing the word of God and standing upon the promises of God. When we read through the word of God, we see the prophet Elijah, that man of God, the great man of God, he saw the importance of mentoring and training others to continue the work that he had started. You see, sometimes the purposes of God cannot be completed in one generation. And this is why that God often introduced himself that I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and I'm the God of Jacob. And Elijah knew. He knew the truth of that. And so he knew that he needed <coughs> to mentor someone else. So Elijah, knowing this truth, equipped Elijah to be his successor. And he imparted in Elijah a real passion, a real desire, a real appetite for the Spirit of God above all things. What sort of appetite have you got today? Do you have an appetite for the things of God or is it just a case of you reading in the morning and that's it? But to be in a living relationship with the living God is to be your appetite, to be your desire. You should be just as fervent for the Lord Jesus Christ now as you was 20, 40 years ago. It should never wane within your life. The Apostle Paul was someone that kept is further serving the Lord. And the Bible tells you to keep that spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. In fact, it tells you to fan into flames the gifts that are within you. So you have a responsibility to keep those things alive. Look, it's just about presenting yourself before the Lord, making yourself available. In the church today, there are many believers, many believers that are tremendously talented, but God can't use them because they never make themselves available. They only ever work within that realm of what they feel comfortable to do. And yet God wants them to move beyond that realm into the realm where they're not comfortable about doing it, but they have to rely upon him. And that's the realm where the miracles take place. When it's not in your ability, when you take a chance upon the presence of God. Anyone can start a work that they have all the finances and everything in place and the backers and the sponsors to do. But when you have no backers, no sponsors, except the living God, that's the place that God wants you to be in. So he wants us to move with this type of faith and have a real fervor. So Elijah was mentoring, teaching, training, equipping his servant Elijah, really to carry that mantle forward. That's exactly what he did. He was teaching him to have spiritual eyes to see. We somehow think it peculiar if a person sees into the spiritual realm. Well, that's God's normal. He wants you to see. If a person can't see in the natural, you would think that person is disadvantaged. So why do we think that a person that sees in the spirit is disadvantaged today? No, they are not. That's the place where God wants you to be. And Elijah was teaching Elijah really to see into that particular realm. So he had to have his eyes open to the supernatural realm. What did Jesus say in the word of God to Nathaniel? He said to him that you will see, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He was the gateway, he was the way in. And he was saying you would see these things. So if Jesus is saying that to one of his disciples, it applies to us today. He wants us to see and to embrace. And the Holy Spirit is the greatest mentor you could ever have. And you need to listen to that wonderful counsellor. 
You need to listen to the one that will lead you into all truth because he is the spirit of truth. There is no error in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit continually works in line with his word. There are many people today that get outside of the word of God. Oh, the Lord's told me to do this and the Lord told me to do that. <laughs> I've met them. The Lord told them nothing when Jesus told me to do it. Well, it must be another Jesus because my Jesus would never tell you to do that. And there are people that serve another Jesus today. The Apostle Paul clearly spoke about that. They get the guidance from a different spirit, even though they're born again of the Spirit of God. If it's not lining up with the truth of God's word, then it's not of him. God will not contradict his word. I don't care what revelation you've got, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not come from the spirit of revelation. We need to rely upon the Lord. So Elijah was teaching him. And it wasn't just a quick fix. Today we're living in a, a society that wants everything instantly. If we don't get served instantly, we're human and hourly. We're in Tesco's with a shopping trolley. We're not getting served quick enough. We're hopping lanes. We're living in the instant microwave age, the drive through age. We want everything instant. But the Bible makes it clear that Elijah served Elijah. He washed his feet. He was his servant. He was his apprentice. And historians would say that was for about a period of 20 years. So there is no rushing where quality is concerned. You want a quick fix, you're not going to get the quality that God wants. God wants quality to flow through your life, to be in your character. He wants you to bear fruit. And part of that bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, is the character of Jesus. And God is looking for men and women of character today. So Elisha was handpicked because God foresaw what he would be like. He would have that desire for the passion and the purposes of God. That's why even when Elijah tried to shake him off while I'm going to Jericho and he goes, well, I'm going to come with you. And he goes, no, you remain here. No, I'm coming. Wherever you go, I'm going. Because he knew the Lord was going to take him that day. How did he know the Lord was going to take him? He had revelations because he'd been in the presence of Elijah. He was mentored by him. The same sort of spirit was affecting him. Listen, if you hung around with an evangelist for a few weeks, you would start to pick up something from them. If you hung around with a prophet for a number of weeks, you would start to pick up something from them. That same sort of spirit would start to affect you. You ever brush past someone that's heavily laden with perfume? You can smell it on you. It's the same when you hang out in the presence of the Lord. Just something of his character, something of his nature starts to affect you. So God raises people up to carry the work of God forward. And so we need to be people that would mentor him. And because Elijah had learned to keep his eyes on that supernatural realm, he saw the very moment when Elijah was going. He'd even asked, Elijah had asked Elijah, what shall I do for you? And he said, I want a double portion of what you've got. I want twice as much. I want to be twice the man of God that you are. Now, we think that was a bit bold, a bit brash, a bit cheeky. But really, it was his appetite for the things of God. And God wants you to have an appetite for him above everything else. When a person is sick, the first thing they lose is their appetite. They don't eat the same. I just have a little bit of soup. Well, God doesn't want you having a little bit of soup when he's laid out a banqueting table for you. And he says, feast. And he says, I've laid it out for you in the presence of your enemies. In other words, you can eat and have a confidence in God no matter what the enemy is doing around you. <clears throat> Elijah had an appetite, he had a desire. He's saying, I want to be twice the man that you are. You know what Elijah said? He said, you've asked a hard thing. He didn't say you've asked an impossible thing. He said, you've asked a hard thing. Did you see me when I go? If all that had taught you work through your life and you've embraced it, you'll probably be able to take the mantle that I'm carrying, that anointing, that it would carry on, and it would twice be anointed. And because he'd been mentored correctly, he saw that today there's people that don't want to be mentored. There's people that if you tell them anything in their life, they get offended. <coughs> Never read in the Word of God, 
about Apollos. He preached the word of God. He preached the word of God eloquently. He preached the word of God so powerfully that he was refusing the Jews who was around and proving that Jesus was the Christ from the scripture. But the Bible tells us that Priscilla and Aquila was listening to him. And when the preacher finished, they got him aside and they said, come back to our house. And he says this, they explained the word of God to him more adequately. They filled in the gaps. Are you someone that would allow God to fill in the gaps in your belief system? Because everybody here today has gaps in their belief system that God wants to fill. Some people have filled those gaps with wrong thoughts and wrong believers. Well, God doesn't want to heal me. And you fill that gap with that belief and that keeps them in a sickness. Whenever you look at the ministry of Jesus, he healed all in the multitude. He healed all that touched him. Every person. He never sent the people away sick. Even the lepers who came, they didn't have a great attitude, did they? Because only one came back. But he still healed them. And he will heal and restore because that's his nature. So God wants us to be mentored. He wants us to grow in the things of God and allow people to speak into our lives and fill those gaps within your life. Be open and teachable. The Bereans, the Bible said, when the Apostle Paul preached, they said, you know, we're going to check it out. And he went and got the scriptures and he looked what Paul had said and found it to be true to the, the, the scriptures. The Bereans have a good attitude. They didn't just swallow anything like the dustbin like many Christians do today. He embraced the truth. And God wants you to be a person that embraces the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. He's the way, the only way. He is the truth. He never lies to you. And he is the life. He will give you an abundant life, a quality of life, a better life than you've got right now. But you've got to want that life. You've got to delight in that life. You can't live two lives. You've got to lay one life down to embrace another. And you need to be someone who embraces the Lord Jesus Christ on a higher level than you're doing right now. <clears throat> church today. All the church today want these nice, comfortable messages. Well, you're at the wrong place. <laughs> if you want a nice, comfortable message, I'll share what God wants me to say to you. Because God isn't interested in your comfort, he's more interested in your holiness. You living right before him. Being a person of genuine integrity, walking right before him. So Elijah was that sort of man. He desired the things of God. And the very fact that the mantle passed on shows us really that God desires one generation to equip the next generation as someone once said, so that our ceilings become their floors. Really, <clears throat> their starting points are greater than where we finish. So that people that come in receive a revelation on a higher level than you did when you came in. And the scripture that we've read this morning shows us that not everyone who has the opportunity, who has a calling upon their lives to embrace the life of God, actually take hold of it. Many are called, only a few are chosen. So the Bible tells us about this particular man. You see, Elijah also had a servant. What he was doing, because he'd been mentored by Elijah, he followed the pattern that he received. Every man of God followed the pattern they received. Moses was someone who built according to the pattern he received on the mountain. What does that mean? In the presence of God. Everything he received in the presence of God, he built his life and he built the community of the people of God upon those revelations. Well, Elijah had received from the Lord. Elijah was someone who encountered the Lord and he mentored Elijah, so Elijah followed his life pattern. And so he knew he had a mentor, he, he knew that uh, he had a servant and he thought, well, I'll have a servant to pass the things on. So Gehazi had the potential to be even twice the man that Elijah was. But to everybody, it was the opportunity to stand in the things of God, actually take hold of it. So even though he had a servant, even though Gehazi was trained by Elijah, even though he saw the supernatural power of God in operation, 
And there are many people that see the supernatural power of God in operation. There are many people that experience God on a great level, but waste their lives. Look at two of Aaron's sons. Two of Aaron's sons was in the presence of God along with Moses. The eight in the presence of God, the Bible tells us. But they died offering a strange life before God. Something they should never have done. So not everyone who has the opportunity embrace it. But yes, I had the opportunity. It saw the power of God displayed. He even saw the Shemanite woman's son restored to life. So he'd seen the raising of the dead. But he never truly desired that supernatural lifestyle for himself because that lifestyle will cost you. There's always a cost to following Jesus at a greater level. You may lose some of your friends because some of your friends are not prepared to journey where you're going in the Lord. And so people come into your life and people go and sometimes you're wondering why they've abandoned you because they're not prepared to go that extra mile. But you've got to be someone that desires the greater things of God. Yes, I did not desire the greater things of God. Yet he wanted all the benefits of it. He wanted the acclaim of it. He wanted the title of being the prophet to the nation. But he didn't want to pay that price. And we need to be people that are prepared to pay the price for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I saw a ministry or his position as a means of personal gain. I wonder how many see that today. You've all been in gatherings, you've all heard meetings. If you bless me, the more you give me, the more I give to you. Really? We all are these type of preachers. If you were so into my ministry, the Lord showing me. <clears throat> People, if you so into my ministry, oh, I just dropped a thousand pounds into my head. If you sow a thousand pounds into my ministry, he's going to bless you abundantly. Well, why doesn't that preacher apply the same principle and sow a thousand pounds into their lives? Yeah. What they're doing is gaining from ministry, <clears throat> and yet the word of God says freely you give them, freely you receive, freely give. We're to give away the gospel. And not to be people that are charging for the things of God. Because Jesus Christ has paid the price. And why should we be charging people for what Jesus Christ has paid for? Amen. So he liked the position. <clears throat> he liked being known and the one that's going to carry it forward. But he wasn't living the particular life that God wanted. The man Gezai could have become somebody great in the sight of God and the sight of man. But instead he became a nobody who was forever remembered for his failures. It doesn't matter what great work you have done, how many years you have served, when a failure comes, that's what people remember you for. <coughs> Look at our Prime Minister today. If you was to go and ask people, what do you think of Boris Johnson? You know what they say? He's a liar. Because the media has told them that continuously, and so they would say that about him. So what's he going to be remembered from? People being a prime minister that brought us out of Europe, or being a prime minister that lied. What's more fresh in the person's mind? The lying. That's what he's going to be remembered for. So he has I, even though he could have been somebody great, he's remembered for his failures. Is remembered for his desire for material wealth rather than the purposes of God. And having a position within the body of Christ is not a place for you to just be taking and taking the benefits that come into the collection pots. It's to serve the Lord with all your heart. God is your provider. God provides you means and your needs regardless of what's placed in a particular pot. And we never to ask men for it. For blessing, for finance, we ask the Lord for it. And then if he chooses, he can ask the men. We trust in the living God and the living God only. Yet his eyes attitude was not changed, even though he'd been in the presence of a man of God for a long time. There's some Christians whose attitude are not changed, even though they're born again of the Spirit of God, even though they speak in tongues. There's still things in their life that need removing. 
and then those places, those voids, fill it with the blessings of God. You know, if you never read in the Bible, Acts chapter 8, it talks about Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer amazed people by his magic powers. In other words, he was a sorcerer, it's a branch of witchcraft. He operated in witchcraft, and it says, small and great alike, they gave him that homage, they gave him that position, they honoured him in that place. He had an influence over that particular region, over that area. One man, under the influence of witchcraft, influenced an entire area. And the influence of the entire area, so small and great, gave him respect. So people in businesses, religious people, politicians, all gave him respect and said, you know, this man, this man has some divine power. Well, the Bible tells us that when he saw the genuine power of God being displayed through Philip, he himself believed. So what is he now? He's a believer, sorcerer, supposedly a servant of God. He's a believer, and not only was he believed, he was baptized. Sometimes Christians have a bit of a problem with that. But the Bible says, repent and be baptized. So you need to follow the things of God and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us he believed and was baptized. But he thought, when he saw the laying on of hands, bringing the power of the Holy Spirit through Peter and John, he thought that he wanted that gift and had valuable money. And Peter says, let your money perish with you. He's basically telling you, hi, and back. Yeah, you're born again. But you're still mixed up. You've still got issues that you need to allow the Lord to deal with and remove from your life. How many believers are like that today? Gehazi sat under the ministry, was personally mentored by one of the greatest men of God. One that did double the miracles that Elijah had done. One that fed thousands like Jesus did. He sat under his ministry and yet he didn't allow his life to be changed. This is the thing for to be doers of the word and not hearers of the so Allow that word. If the word of God makes you uncomfortable, don't come to me after and go, oh, Pastor Dave, you, you were using that message. You were speaking that message at me. You know, I've heard that many, many times. Go, I go, I go at me. <coughs> I will work with the one who, who, who told me what to say. The one who wrote it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will convict you of things in your life because he loves you so much he won't leave you in the state you were in. He has eyes. Attitude was not right. He could have been a great man of God, but he didn't follow Jesus, follow the Lord with a whole heart. You know. Sometimes in our lives, we're going to be people that recognize there are times and seasons in every person's life where personal choices will determine who you become. God expects at these times for us to come to the forefront. We're living in such times today where the nation is desperate to hear and see the genuine of God. It's desperate to see the true church function as Jesus Christ intended it. So God is looking for men and women today who are men and women of integrity who will serve him with our whole heart, not for reward. To serve him for our whole life. God's looking for that. I spoke to people on the street yesterday. I spoke to a Muslim man. He doesn't have a problem believing in Jesus. He just has a problem believing that he's the son of God and he's the saviour. Mm -hmm. So you're going to try to move him from where he is to a place he's believing in the living God. And he said, uh, you know, I, I believe he was wrapped in the army. I said, well, Jesus healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He drove out demons. He raised the dead. He did all types of miracles. He did even <coughs> the and said that Jesus never sinned. Do you agree with him? I said, but the army did not at least stay to tell me he was the greatest. 
and he just looked at me puzzled. But it was able to talk to me about, well, I do believe in Jesus that you need to be born again. You have to explain the truth to people. Now, even if that person doesn't accept that truth straight away, what you were doing, you were moving him from a place to a greater place of belief. Someone else may come along and share with them. And they may move them even forward, more, more closer to Jesus than they are right now. <coughs> but we've got to share the word of God with them. The world is desperate to hear the truth today. The world are in chaos. There's no proper direction for people today. There's no accountability even for people in positions of power. And people don't know which way to turn because things are being taken from them. Cost of living rises, worry about jobs, income, the children, their education. Everything's weighing people down. The only solution that God has given is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the solution, but you have to present that solution to them. And you have to be someone who lives that solution in your own life so that people can see it. So you demonstrate the presence and the power of God and the integrity of God. I'm not bothered if someone watches me all week long. Because you know what? They will not find me stealing. They will not find me lying. I've been in the industry, I've been in the workplace, I did not take things from those workplaces. In fact, before I became a believer, I took lots of things from the workplace. But when I became a believer, God said to me, take them back. That was so difficult. Getting past the security man with a bag full of tools is very difficult. But I had to take them back. So I put the things right. But if people watch me, they will not find me swearing. I could hit me full with a hammer. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I would not swear in those circumstances. I've been put through the test in those areas. It doesn't come out. See, what comes out of you in difficult times is already within you. Amen. It's not a blip, it's already within you. It needs removing. There needs to be growth in your life and change within your life. And you're on a journey. And you need to be advancing. There should be no Christian that remains in the same place, stuck in the same spot, stagnant. A stagnant pool does not produce the life that God wants. We've got to be progressing in the things of God, moving into the deeper things. God even showed the prophet Ezekiel about when he waded into the water, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, till he was swimming. It was increments of blessing, increments of change within his life. That is what God is looking for today. So Gehazi could have been someone great, but he wasn't a man of integrity. The Bible even tells us he questioned his master's decision. My master, Elijah, was too easy on me by not taking what he'd offered. You see, you know why he never took what was offered? Because he wanted Naaman to know you cannot buy healing. It's already paid for. Jesus Christ has paid the price. And it was a free gift from God to him. But Gehazi was messing up with God's pattern of what God was doing. He questioned his master's decision and, you know, not to take the wealth and the riches for ministry. And you see, sometimes we think that we know best. And yet you can follow your own advice and follow your own desires to get rich and miss out on the wonderful life that Jesus Christ would offer. You know, Elijah questioned Gehazi. He asked him where he'd been, where he'd been. And the Bible tells us that he lied. Elijah said, says to him, where have you been, Gehazi? Elijah asked. Your servant didn't go anywhere. You see how one sin leads to another. He's now lying. He's lying to the prophet of God. And what does Elijah say? Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot? The world of knowledge operates in areas of present situations and past situations. And he doesn't just operate in the areas of healing where you release a word of knowledge in respect to it, to somebody's sickness, what they're going through at that time. But it releases that word of knowledge of what that person has been up to, what that person is doing, where they've been. What did Jesus say to Nathaniel? I saw you while you was under the fig tree. Jesus had not travelled to the fig tree, his spirit saw him there. 
This is exactly what Elijah is saying. Uh, Elijah is saying to the servant Gaza. I was there. I saw you there. I know exactly what you've done. So he questioned him. And it was the word of knowledge that allowed him to see. He not only knew what Gehazi had done, he knew the intentions of his heart because he took two talents of silver and two garments of clothing. He took 20% of some of the items that Naaman brought. 20%. Even God only asked for 10. He took 20%. And Elijah said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes? And then he says, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, men servants, maid servants. Why is he saying that when he only took clothes and talents? Because what he was going to do with that talent and money was to buy those things. So I'm saying that Elijah knew not only what he had done, but he knew the intentions of his heart, why he had done it. And God always looks at the motivation of your heart, why you do a certain thing. There are people that do Christian works today that look good on the surface, but God sees the motivation is position. The motivation, you know, is to be noticed, to have, to have a name or a reputation. Well, the Word of God tells us that we're to make ourselves like Jesus of no reputation. So if someone says I'm going to ruin your reputation, well, praise God. <laughs> praise God because you shouldn't have it anyway. But he saw the motivation, and I'm saying to you today that God sees the things you do. And everyone else may praise him and say, isn't that wonderful? But God sees the motivation, the intention, the purpose for you doing the work. So it's not just the work you do, it's the purpose why you do it that's important. Why do you do the things you do as a believer? Do you do it for yourself? Or are you doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ? We're to do it for him, to give glory and honour to him. Because he desires. You know why I would go out and evangelise? Because the Father's heart is for the lost. You know why I would evangelise? Because I want to bring trophies of grace to Jesus Christ. I want to present something before him. Because the word of God says, No man shall appear before the Lord empty handed. So I want to bring him the greatest treasure that he delights in. And that's people that coming into a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ surrendered in what lies to him. So it may cost you to do those things. But the rewards are great because you're presenting Jesus Christ with the trophies that he desires. Let's be people that move into them. So, Gehazi, he gained wealth. His two talents of silver, 75 pounds of silver, probably equated to today between 15 and 20 thousand pounds. Now you might say, well that's not a lot by today's standard. It was by their standard. Where would that put you today? It put you up there. You'd be buying a house in Alfredson. <laughs> it puts you in a better place. It gained tremendous wealth, but the cost was great. He lost his health, he lost his honor, and he lost his calling. We need to be people that do not dishonor the Lord or the office that God has put us in. He dishonored the prophetic office so that nation would think these prophets, they just did it for what they can get. How many people think that about church and ministers today? They just did it for what they got. <coughs> and he has got six jets. Well, he's got eight. They're ready for what they can get. I don't believe that's the Lord's intention at all. He took money for a miracle that was already paid for. And so the Bible tells us his sin was exposed and the penalty of that sin came that he got something else from Naaman because the Bible says this, Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. You know, there's power of life and death in the tongue. When the prophet uttered those words, it came about. 
And this didn't wait a period of time for it to come about, like many prophecies today. It instantly was activated. And so the Bible tells us that his flesh became white as snow. He left the presence of, of Elijah, and he was left as as white as snow. Let it cling to you and your descendants forever. So his sin not only affected his life, it affected those that came after him, the next generation. So we could mentor the next generation. We could deposit things in their lives, good or bad. His conduct, his behavior, affected the next generation. It says, let it cling to your descendants forever. Maybe today, people we represent are really descendants of Gehazi. And really, there needs to be a curse that is broken in that area. I pray for people with leprosy. I've got hold of their hands, I've touched them, I've never got leprosy. I touched them, they became clean, and they become unclean. Jesus Christ heals and restores their skin, completely heals them. Yeah, as I, what he did, his behavior, his attitude affected the next generation. Does your behavior, does your attitude to the things of God affect those in your household, the next generation? Who in turn will affect the next? His actions affected others. Actions today, what you do, will affect the lives of others. Sin is never isolated, folks. If a person sins, it always is a consequence for the next person. Having sinned, and the consequence is what? He was cast out of the presence of God. Hence, we're in this place today. But Jesus' actions upon the cross of Calvary was to restore his life back. That everything that was lost at the fall of man <coughs> was recovered when the Son of Man, the last Adam, laid down his life on Calvary's cross. We have a great future in the things of God. Providing we embrace and become the people that God has intended us to be. Allow the Holy Spirit to mentor you. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to lead and direct your life. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, the word of God says. If the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, come away and pray. Turn your favorite program off and go away and pray. If you made arrangements to go somewhere and the Holy Spirit says, come spend the time with me, cancel it. Cancel it. Well, I've not seen them in six months. Well, they can wait long enough for that. Cancel it. You can wait a little bit longer. Spend that time in the presence of God. Make the Lord your priority in your life. Evaluate yourself. Look at where you are right now. And say, could have been bigger? Could have been better for the Lord? Could have moved in the more dynamic of the Holy Spirit like a reaper in the Word of God? Absolutely you can. You're the person you want to be right now. We have to press into the greater things of God. We're going to pray right now. If the Lord's been speaking to you, you need prayer, you just come forward and sit and your body will pray for it. And God will move in power. He'll heal you, restore you, will fill you. Maybe today, you're flat. You've lost a bit of power, just like your mobile phone. And you need that recharging up in the presence of the power of God. So you can be the person that God has intended you to be. Maybe you've made mistakes in your life, you've pursued other things like wealth and position. Well, today is the day to surrender your life and just say, Father, I just humble myself before you. I just lower myself before you that you can raise me up in Jesus. And God will do that when he sees the condition of your heart. There's a God that loves you and cares for you and wants you to be the best that you can be for him. Why settle just for being average? Why settle for being mediocre? We need to be people that will really excel in the great things of God. Let's pray right now. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that attitudes and motives of our heart would be found to be acceptable before you. I pray that you would remove, Father God, the little foxes that spoil the vine within our lives in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, that we might be the men and the women of God that you intend us to be, that we may embrace the things that Jesus Christ has purchased for us and, Father, live the life that he intends us to live, that we would start now. It is never too late. Father, that's a lively enemy, and we break that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are candidates, Father God, for greatness in you. And so, Father, we simply start to move in to the place and the position that you have for us in Jesus' name.
Amen. 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 Will you be blessed? Will you be praised?